Now, without wasting time, we will go to the second keynote address, at which will be given by Professor Veronica Van Hennigen. But before going on to talk about that, I'm going to give a brief um, background about Professor Veronica, after which we would have His Excellency also give his remark. So uh, I first met Professor Veronica like two years ago when she delivered another high profile keynote address at the University of Sussex. And uh, since then, I got in touch for the opportunity of mentorship, for criticism on my fellowship applications and other things that I do. And she has always been there to support and guide me. But that is not really the background. Let me give you a general background about her as a scientist. So Professor Veronica studied natural sciences at Cambridge University, followed by Doctor, uh, Doctor of Philosophy in Oxford. This focused on human gene mapping using somatic cell hybrids. Subsequently, as a postdoctoral researcher and young group leader in the MRC Human Genetics Unit in Edinburgh in the UK, she worked on the early positional cloning of major genes implicated in development, the developmental eye malformations. Professor Van Hagen, last lasting passion for genetics was established while studying under the University of Cambridge Natural Sciences Tripos and during her University of Oxford Diffield. And as a Bide Memorial Fellow, she moved to Edinburgh in 1974 with the aim of using somatic hybrids for gene mapping at the MRC Mammalian Genome Unit. This plan was finally realized following her move in 1977 to what is now the MRC Human Genetics Unit in the Institute of Genetics and Molecular Medicine. Professor Van Hennigen then decided to pursue functional studies following the identification of FAPAC-6 as a key gene for eye development through the study of aniridia. Subsequent projects began with genetic analysis of human disease, but used model systems to explore key principles, such as control of gene expression by distant regulators and why genetic diseases outcomes are so variable. Veronica is a fellow of numerous academic societies, including the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Academy of Medical Sciences, and the Royal Society. As an EMBO member, she sat on EMBO Council. She was also president of the European Society of Human Genetics and subsequently of the UK Genetics Society. In retirement, she is an honorary professor at the University of Edinburgh and also at the Institute of Ophthalmology, University College London. As of 2019, she chairs the Diversity Committee of the Royal Society. She has received many awards in recognition of her work including being appointed commander of the order of the British Empire, CBE, for services to science in 2010. In addition, she was awarded the, Char the Carter Medal of the Clinical Genetics Society in 2011. And I can go on and on to mention the fantastic career achieved by Professor Veronica, but I guess this is, it's not for me to talk today, it's for her to give her keynote address after which we would also have another remark from His Excellency. Professor Veronica, you are highly welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I hope you can hear me and I'm going to try sharing my screen. Uh, here it is, I hope. Share, yep. Yes, is that okay? Yes, all good, all good. Fantastic. Um, well, that was uh, really an embarrassingly um, uh, big uh, introduction. So I, I'm always nervous when I talk, but it'll be all right once we start. So we're going to start. So I'm going to talk about uh, the genetics of disease as lessons for biology, because I think biologists have been using genetics as a tool for a very long time. And you've already just heard from Sir Richard how um, useful these tools can be in many aspects of life. Um, I will bring in uh, some ideas about diversity and I, I'll start by saying that actually biology is a great model for um, seeing how useful diversity is because biological systems consist of many, many components uh, which fill different niches, which fulfill different functions and collaborate together. And that is what life is. Uh, and that 
kind of organization is very important for societies as well. So uh, I think the future of science in Africa is absolutely essential, not only for Africa, but for the rest of the world. And therefore it is uh, very important that we all work together to take this um, initiative that has been started by um, Mahmoud uh, for setting up the BioRTC. And it's great that there are so many of you uh, involved in this. Um, oh. How do I, oh, I have to use this. Yes. Okay. So, um, so one of the things about um, systems that are running smoothly is that it's actually quite difficult to understand um, how they work. And it's when something goes wrong that you begin to have to take to pieces the system. Um, that's to understand the phenotype and start troubleshooting. Um, and uh, in case of uh, genetics, that's uh, searching for genes and their effects and how things have gone wrong in biology. Of course, there are always not only genetic components, but also environmental ones. And we mustn't forget that because actually it's the environment that is most easily manipulable in order to uh, improve things. However, um, I just wanted you to see that my vision for um, the idea of uh, disease genetics uh, producing biology, understanding of biology, and then vice versa, you can also go from biology to understanding the disease better and to developing a disease management and uh, drug development um, strategies. Uh, and so we're going to talk a bit about that. So first of all, um, Let's see, the human genome is huge. Uh, there are six times, six billion, six times 10 to the nine uh, nucleotides in the human genome. And any two genomes of people around the globe are 99% identical. Now this is of interest when you're thinking about diversity. That still means that there are 6 million differences on average between uh, any two uh, individuals. Uh, and we have to take that into account. And that is what makes us diverse and different and able to do slightly different things, but with overlapping uh, capabilities and the ability to work together. Obviously, some of this variation has functional consequences, uh, including uh, non-coding variation, because actually the coding component of the genome, as we'll see in a minute, is very small. So that's the component which gets uh, transcribed and translated into amino acids, into proteins. There is no such thing as a disease gene. There are just genes which have functions. And when something goes wrong, uh, there, uh, may, there, there may be an involvement of gene, uh, an association of that uh, variant with the disease process. And if we understand it, then we might be able to do something about the disease. It's also interesting to note that variants which are deleterious in one context may be advantageous in another or, or at another time. We have to uh, be available to look at genotype phenotype correlations uh, in order to understand the biology. So that looking at the phenotype, looking at uh, exactly what is happening in your organism at different stages in life is very, very important. Uh, and so it's useful to collect carefully described patient cohorts. And I, I'm sure that that is something that is beginning to be done in Africa as well. Uh, and uh, we also need uh, careful descriptions of the phenotype and the controlled vocabulary, because increasingly uh, everything goes into databases uh, and uh, we should be able to use machine learning to understand um, everything. Sorry, so the diversity just refers to that um, variation between two individuals. Okay, so uh, we've already said how big the genome is. And that means that there are two meters of DNA per cell and uh, the DNA is wrapped around protein packages, the nucleosomes, 
Uh, and the whole thing is then looped and folded into 23 pairs of chromosomes. And one of the big surprises of the Human Genome Project was that there are only 21,000 genes in the human genome, which is a real surprise. That's protein coding genes. Maybe that doesn't include the RNA genes, which are not translated. Um, people expected it to be nearer to 100,000 because they thought the more complex the organism, the greater the number of genes. A fruit fly has 14,000 genes. So actually, the complexity has been acquired no, you can go ahead. I'll, I'll sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. So one of the big, uh, so I use this for a school talk um, and it just uh, illustrates how huge the genome is, how long the DNA is, and that every day we each uh, make three times 10 to the 11 cells in our bodies. That's when we are healthy. And that means that we have to replicate enough DNA to go three times between the Earth and the Sun. And you can imagine how fragile that DNA is and how complicated uh, that process uh, is. So we've already said that the coding region is tiny. There are introns and there are variants within introns. And that's the split gene theory that we heard about that was discovered by Sir Richard and uh, some others. Uh, and, um, and there are other regulatory se sequences between the genes and sometimes overlapping so that there are regulatory sequences for one gene in the introns or in the space between uh, other genes. Uh, and there are other uh, non-coding uh, variants uh, as well. But the, the vast majority of the genome, we don't fully understand. There are... Uh, um, repetitive elements and, and we don't understand fully what they uh, do, but they are important. And uh, in my view, it would all be lost in evolution if it didn't have some function, if nothing else than to generate further uh, variability as things evolve. So gene function can be perturbed in many different ways. Uh, and so there are different kinds of mutations and we can learn quite a lot about gene function by exploring exactly uh, what, mutate, what types of mutations can cause disease. Uh, some diseases can be caused by different mutations in uh, the same gene. Different diseases can be caused by different mutations in the same gene. And similar diseases can be caused by different mutations in different genes. Um, we've already heard about the uh, interrupted uh, gene, and it's, it is through alternative splicing, really, that we believe that extra complexity has evolved uh, in, for example, um, higher uh, primates. Uh, and you can see uh, uh, big changes even by searching, by database analysis, by sequence analysis, uh, between higher primates and, and hominids. So the genetics of disease um, is uh, very well studied. Um, and you will all have heard about Mendelian inheritance when there are family patterns of inheritance and they can include autosomal dominant diseases. And I've chosen a few neurological abnormalities to illustrate uh, the talk uh, on this occasion, there are autosomal recessive abnormalities where the two parents have to be carrying uh, the, the variant genes and the same and the variant genes have to meet up in a child in order for that child to be affected by the disease, whereas autosomal dominant, uh, the parent is affected and then uh, it can be passed on to 50% of the children. And there are also X-linked um, uh, abnormalities and one very well known set of examples because there are many, many genes for intellectual disability on the X chromosome and there are many other uh, X chromosome linked diseases. There are also complex diseases which are not so obviously um, clear cut. They, they, there are no clear patterns of family inheritance, uh, but there is familial aggregation of these diseases. Uh, so there is a genetic component. And so 
those are being examined uh, in more detail. Things like autism spectrum disorders, migraine, epilepsy, etc., and some uh, and, and the number of eye diseases as well. And many of these diseases are the late onset diseases, and so they're also significantly affected by environmental interactions. So I chose um, primary microcephaly, uh, and this is work done by an erstwhile colleague of mine in Edinburgh, Andrew Jackson, and his group, uh, beautiful work where they looked at uh, um, many, most of these uh, cases are autosomal recessive, uh, and they have identified many of the genes um, that are implicated, although there are still others yet to be identified. And here, uh, uh, showing uh, in a paper recently uh, the finding that condensins, which are involved in the compaction of chromosomes uh, in both metaphase chromosomes and interphase chromosomes, there are hom two homologous complexes with homologous member genes, uh, not identical, some of them, or the SMC2 and SMC4. Uh, are um, involved in both sets of complexes in the cytoplasm and the nucleus. And these genes are really important when uh, fast cell division has to take place in the development of the brain. And if there's something wrong with this mechanism or some other mitotic mechanisms, then the brain doesn't grow properly during development and microcephaly and intellectual disability um, ensues. And um, so there are also um, autosomal dominant uh, neurological diseases, for example, dominant heredit hereditary peripheral neuropathy, such as charcot marie tooth disease. So that's uh, the old fashioned way of naming a disease after some of the discoverers. Uh, and uh, here uh, it's a peripheral nerve conduction disease, a demyelinating disease. Uh, it's progressive, but it's uh, congenital. Uh, and uh, it's really a problem. And there are some interesting mechanisms of um, getting the mutations by unequal crossing over and uh, recurrent generation of deletions and duplications. And very funnily, the most commonly involved gene, PMP22, which uh, is a myelinating gene, um, gaining an extra copy is, uh, produces a more severe phenotype than losing a copy of that gene. So there's still a, a normal copy on the other chromosome. And there are many genes involved uh, in uh, this disease. Um, now, neurodevelopmental diseases, which almost always involve some degree of intellectual disability, are very, very common. There's a high genetic burden for these. Uh, and uh, a huge number of genes have been identified. They're involved in many different mechanisms that are critical for neurological function. Uh, and they can be of many different uh, patterns of inheritance. But the amazing thing that has only been discovered in the last few years, five years at most, is that a very high proportion of uh, the mutations are actually de novo mutations. And because these diseases are very severe, and uh, the children who are intellectually, who have this uh, disability are very often are unable to reproduce. Uh, these diseases are genetic, but they are not inherited. And I, um, having uh, been involved a bit uh, with um, Galton's tenets and uh, his ideas about eugenics, because University College London has had a lot of um, problems thinking about the history of uh, eugenics, um, it's interesting to think that Galton, want, the main thing he wanted to eliminate is intellectual disability. But if this is the common pattern of inheritance, that's to say it's not inherited, it, although it's genetic, it's new mutations. Actually, you couldn't do selection to eliminate this kind of disease. So that's really interesting. And uh, a lot of the genes um, I told you are on the X chromosome and sometimes they interact. So uh, the, uh, the K D uh, 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 lysine demethylase that affects uh, the organization of the chromatin uh, is controlled by several other nearby genes on the X chromosome. 
Now, a lot of these uh, diseases can be studied, as we heard uh, alluded to yesterday, for example, uh, using model organisms. And I think this uh, is really a fantastic approach to looking at the biology. For example, Drosophila, uh, which I think you could do Drosophila genetics pretty easily in Africa, is, um, is a wonderful uh, model system, for example, for learning. And, and a lot of mutants in Drosophila have been identified way before genes were being identified. They had funny names um, like dunce uh, and vegetables like rutabaga. Uh, and then the genes were identified subsequently. And some of those genes are the same genes that are implicated in human uh, intellectual disability. And then increasingly, we're uh, learning to use uh, induced pluripotential stem cells, uh, which involve cell culture and uh, people are developing better and better ways of directed differentiations in culture so that they can uh, explore gene function and uh, regulation of gene expression uh, in uh, disease relevant sub tissues, organoids, they're not quite the same as tissues, but they can give you a lot of insights. And ultimately, it is hoped that some of these cells might be used for therapeutic purposes to help replace cells that are damaged in genetic diseases. The complex disease associations are um, uh, now uh, followed by genome-wide uh, disease association studies on very large cohorts. Uh, and here, uh, uh, re um, segregation analysis is done on huge cohorts of 100,000 or more individuals. Uh, and they produce these Manhattan plots uh, that they look like skyscrapers. And uh, at the bottom, we've got the chromosome numbers um, here. Uh, and, uh, you can, and you can identify the variants that might be segregating with the disease that you're interested in. And I told you that these diseases have many different genes that are implicated in their etiology. And, 90% of the variants that people are looking at are actually in the non-coding regions, so that they are really almost certainly regulatory variants. Uh, and those are the ones that are also most uh, frequently affected by environmental uh, variation and environmental manipulation, which is good news because that means that we might be able to do something eventually when we understand the biology about some of these genes like autism spectrum pathways. Okay, so you heard that um, I have been working on eyes quite a lot. Uh, and eyes, of course, are an extension of the brain, certainly the retina and the optic nerve. Uh, and there are very many different uh, genes implicated in eye disease, partly because on the whole, eye diseases are not lethal. Uh, and so they are, in many cases familial and uh, now this is a bit out of date uh, from 19 uh, from 2018 but uh, well over 300 probably 400 different uh, retinal disease genes have been identified my own interest has been in transcription factor diseases um, that is serendipitous because we started looking for the gene way before the genome project had fully started um, for and the, the abnormality called aniridia, which is absence of the iris of the eye. This is the iris of the eye. And um, the genes that are, the gene, the main gene that's implicated is PEC6. And then we also started looking at uh, reduced eye size and the absence of eyes, no eyes. So that's microphthalmia and anophthalmia. And two other genes that were identified in our labs with my colleagues are SOX2 and OTX2, but PEC6 is mainly what I'm going to say a little bit about. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. Anyway, PEC6 is a very ancient gene. It's very highly conserved. And there are many model organisms. And uh, we and others have identified mutations in mice, in zebrafish, uh, in C. elegans, which has no eyes, but it's got a neural system and a sensory system. Uh, and it's got PEC6 mutations that are very like some of the PEC6 mutations in human aniridia. And then there's the Drosophila gene, eyeless, uh, 
uh, which turns out to be PEC6, which was identified after uh, the anirida gene was uh, found to be PEC6, and it was identified in Walter Gehring's lab. And he did this wacky experiment where he uh, expressed PEC6 um, either from flies, but also even from mice and human uh, in funny places in the developing fly and they generated eyes. So he called it the master eye gene. I think that's a bit of an oversimplification, but it is a very wacky and interesting experiment. And it does show how uh, powerful some of these uh, transcription factors are in inducing pathways uh, that are, go up, down a particular uh, path. So the gene, we, well, the first thing we did was find out uh, where the gene is expressed. Uh, and it's not only in the eye, but also in the brain and then the neural tube, and also, funnily enough, in the pancreas. Nowadays, you wouldn't have to do these experiments because now there are loads and loads of databases which can give you the expression pattern for many, many different genes. So if you identify a new, uh, a new disease gene, we already probably know where it's expressed. Now, one of the interesting experiments that we uh, did because uh, Aniridia was sometimes associated with chromosomal breakpoints quite a long way away from the actual coding region of the gene, was to show that uh, PAC6 has a large uh, region on either side of the gene, which is required for the proper expression of the gene. So we only got proper expression from uh, a PAC6 uh, reporter transgene, uh, a yeast artificial chromosome, um, if it contained a large amount of DNA. And that's quite difficult to handle. And here we've put a reporter in instead of the PAC6 gene. So we've got a fluorescent marker showing expression of the gene. And this is classical aniridia. And we learn a lot from the mutational spectrum. It's actually uh, a so-called haploinsufficiency disease, uh, which means that one copy of the gene is not enough. So it, it, it segregates as an autosomal dominant. When it segregates, it's quite, it's not infrequently a new mutation, but from then on, it's passed on as an autosomal dominant. Uh, but it's, it's the absence of uh, the function from one copy of the gene that causes classical aniridia. But there are missense mutations, some of which are milder than classical aniridia, and some of them are more severe than classical aniridia. And there are many other ways in which we can perturb the function of uh, PEC6. So here are some very severe missense mutations which have turned up recurrently. And it's only by serendipity that we looked in these individuals who do not have aniridia, but we looked for PEC6 mutations and identified them. And the same mutation arising anew because it's a very severe mutation and a lot of these individuals, again, don't reproduce. Um, uh, so it tells us that this is a real phenomenon because it's exactly the same mutation that arises repeatedly causing the severe phenotype. Uh, and there is an overlap with some of the milder SOX2 mutations. The very severe SOX2 mutations, again, a haploinsufficiency, uh, are associated with absence of eyes. Uh, and very often these children are given artificial eyes because it helps their, their, their facial growth by putting in eyes, um, artificial eyes, and then expanding them and allowing them to look a bit more normal. Um, and the amazing thing about PEC6 and SOX2 is that they interact. They are co-expressed in several places. And, and they, uh, the, the two proteins bind to each other and they work together to regulate a number of enhancers. For example, for the crystalline gene, which is one of the major proteins in the lens, but they also regulate themselves and each other. And the sequences that they bind to are very different. They are not the same sequences. They are very specific. And I think that it's the stoichiometry of the PAC6 and uh, SOX2, their ratio in different tissues. And you can see almost on this eye that the ratio between them is different in different places in the eye, even at this one stage. This is uh, immunohistochemistry, so pretty quantitative. Uh, and it's the stoichiometry of these transcription factors which determines exactly how they bind. Uh, and that is what controls 
the progress of development. Now, we were very excited when we looked at our cohort, we find the PEC6 mutation in a very high proportion of aniridia patients, but here was one in whom we didn't find it. So my colleagues started to sequence the non-coding region well outside the gene. And they found a single nucleotide change, a new change that was not present in either of the parents of this child in a region which was uh, a breakpoint region in one of the translocations that could also lead to aniridia. And uh, for other colleagues with whom we had collaborated, collaboration is always fantastic, had shown that this was an autoregulatory region of um, the PAC6 gene. Uh, and uh, we could show um, transgenesis uh, using enhancers made with the wild type and also separately with the mutant version of the same uh, enhancer region that uh, the, uh, this region is responsible for expression of PEXIX in the lens, for example, and the mutation abolishes uh, the ability of PEXIX to be properly expressed uh, in the lens, both in mice and zebrafish transgenics. Finally, uh, we've done some um, uh, uh, database analysis and hidden mark of modeling to look for new um, targets of uh, PAC6 around the genome. And I mentioned this partly because I think one of the things that you must develop in Africa is uh, computer uh, savvy uh, ways of looking at things like genomics. Uh, and I'm sure you've already got it going. Um, uh, because there is so much that can be done in this way uh, now. And uh, this process allowed us to um, predict the number of target genes, uh, which are shown here in the gray boxes. And some of those target genes have subsequently been identified as eye disease genes, and others were already known eye disease genes. Uh, and uh, it shows here how we've got a, a complex network of transcription factors interacting with each other, which are implicated in eye disease mechanisms. So we've got a fantastic way of looking at the genome, learning about biology, and hopefully using that biology to develop uh, ways of treating disease. And uh, I talked about disease uh, studies, but it's equally relevant or just or even more relevant to things like agriculture and animal genetics and so on. Uh, and this was my lab uh, just before uh, a little while before I retired. Um, and now I'm retired, but I'm still pretty involved uh, in other people's work. And I love mentoring young individuals. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Veronica, this has been a fantastic presentation. For all the audience over here, this is a summary of over 40 years of scientific research. Uh, for me, it just kind of gives this message that you don't just do research and think about getting breakthroughs over a, a year or two years or 30, you could spend your entire scientific career trying to achieve something. You've really done that. Thank you so much for being here. But again, I will now hand over the, um, the, uh, uh, the kind of um, Zoom uh, discussion to our leader, our father, and uh, mentor, the Honorable Governor of Yebe State, uh, uh, kind of pre represented by His Excellency, the Deputy Governor of Yebe State, for his remark. Thank you very Thank much. You very Afternoon, participants. Thank you, Professor, for the insightful. It's an honor to have a high figure in the in this meeting. Exceptional, and is and showcase a capability that all scientists are to follow importantly. We are inspired by your commitment to diversify in science as a chair of the diversity committee of the Royal Society. Your presence here means a lot to the entire people of Yobe State, Nigeria, and indeed Africa. As you know, 
Africa has the most remarkable genetic diversity of all continents. Yet there is still so much to be done to uncover the importance of such diversity towards understanding human health and diseases. Thus, we will appreciate any support through you or your networks to initiate to, 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 to initiatives like this laboratory to ensure Africa has the capacity for pursuing research that may have a global implication. Once again, I will thank all the speakers that spare their precious time to grace this symposium. I also thank Mr. Dr. Mena and his team training and research in natural science for development in Africa and all other donors worldwide that support this initiative. We look forward to future collaboration and mentorship to our enthusiastic researchers. Thank you and God bless.